This is the Impact Report. I'm your host, Katie Elman. The Impact Report brings together students and faculty in Bard College's MBA in Sustainability program with leaders in business, sustainability, finance, social entrepreneurship, and more. These conversations go live the first and third Friday of each month. This week, I'm speaking with career strategist Warren Goldberg. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, Warren. I'm so excited to talk to you about your work. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So there's a lot of talk about impact and purpose and sustainability everywhere it seems nowadays and sometimes these terms are used interchangeably and are often watered down for the benefit of the organization using them and I find that an unfortunate byproduct of that is that they no longer represent the full breadth of their meanings so as a career strategist for purpose-driven professionals how do you and your clients define purpose so I work with purpose-driven professionals and the way that I we loosely define this is folks who want to make a greater impact, who want to make a difference. And um, many of those folks are working in the social impact and sustainability space, uh, but not all of them, right? Some of them are interested in health tech and um, software development for, you know, uh, the greater good. And so, um, so that's how, you know, I, my clients loosely use that, that term, but, um, you know, I think being purpose driven is, is something that, you know, not everybody has that as part of their career, as part of their like driving force in their career. Um, and so the reason that I work with folks like that is because they, they see themselves as being part of um, something greater and and wanting to contribute to making the world a better place. And so um, I love working with the folks that that are are driven that way because I'm also driven that way. and um, and then seeing the impact that they make in their careers, like really changing the world, changing culture, changing laws, um, changing the status quo. So it's really, um, it just seems like a, you know, it's something that resonates with me in my in my career or my work and um, maybe even my generation as a millennial and how we grew up, uh, what we were taught and 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 then you know working with folks that that just care to use the precious time that they have in you know not just making money, just not just getting making um, you know getting a paycheck, but also using your time to make the world a better place. Thank you for that. Now, you know, we've both talked about how this purpose-driven work and impact, people wanting to make a positive impact in every facet of their lives extends to, you know, their employment and their careers. I'm interested to hear how your business has evolved in the last year, being still in the pandemic, in the great (laughs) resignation, so-called great resignation. Um, what have you been seeing on the ground in your work um, during this time? And did you anticipate something like the great resignation happening? Yeah, so even early days pandemic, I mean, I I was unemployed at the time. Uh, I was actually job searching. And it turns out that um, when there's a global pandemic and and nobody's hiring, but you have figured out yourself, like what I, I had figured out what I wanted to do. Um, I. I had to give myself permission to to do that and and just get started and just try it. Um, so that's how um, how c- coaching actually developed is um, you know beyond just my professional experience. My my personal experience was that I had was experiencing a career identity crisis um, during the during the pandemic and and having started having having navigated from like, I don't know what I'm doing with myself and my, my life. And I don't know what my, like, not even realizing how much worth I had beyond 
how much money I was making, what my job title was, you know, having to do that work and then navigate into like, yes, I, I see my value beyond what my job title is. And I know how I want to um, spend my time each week, um, what I want to actually do for work. And so I actually started this business um, during the pandemic. And I think a lot of people actually did too. They took up entrepreneurship during the pandemic. Um, so the way that I've seen this change, so no, I did not anticipate the great resignation. I also heard it, um, somebody call it the, the great reshuffle. Um, and so I didn't anticipate that, but uh, now that it's, it's happened, I'm, I'm definitely not surprised. I think that in general, people are looking for a greater sense of belonging in their work. They're realizing that, um, you know, I think early days pandemic, people didn't want to take any risks. And then as they started to see, like, um, actually, maybe this is a good time to take a risk uh, and, and try something new and find a company that is going to treat me better. That's going to um, make me feel more valued. And in addition to um, just more flexibility, I think that's really like the other thing that people are seeking. So, um, so again, not surprised that it's happening. And I also think it was a good wake up call for companies to realize like, oh, okay, we actually need to um, treat our employees like, like humans, right? <laughs> At, in the least, <laughs> treat right. them like them. exactly, exactly. Like at the very least, at the most foundational level, like at the end of the day, companies are made up of humans. Like let's treat each other like humans and not like money makers or like numbers or um, you know, yeah. Just it's so important. Do you find um, there's a common thread with your clients? Are they mostly looking for just the purpose? Are they trying to segue into different careers? Like what are your clients saying to you? So my clients are looking for balance. They are looking for opportunities where they can make an impact, but not at the expense of their personal life, their personal dreams, their um, time with their family and, and friends and loved ones. And so, um, you know, it's, it's something that is partially based on like the culture of a company and the culture of a team and a culture of an industry really, but it's, but it's also on us as individuals to recognize what our needs are, what our boundaries are and, and be able to advocate for ourselves to, to stick to those. So, um, so that's really where I'm helping my clients is figuring out what those non-negotiable needs are, figuring out what priorities are going to um, actually help them make decisions so that they can recognize the, like this company, this environment is going to be a place where I can thrive and I'll be, um, I'll be contributing to, some, to something that fuels my fire, that motivates me, that aligns with my passion and purpose, but also, allows me to be a human beyond how, I, you know, how I'm associated with this, this company. And, and again, just like what my job title is and, how, and what money I'm making. And it's, it's like, like we're focusing on the, the, the whole, the whole big picture, the, the whole person and, and not just the career piece. Some people are able to compartmentalize work, but I think it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. I've personally never been able to <laughs> compartmentalize. It's really hard. Right? I agree with you because yeah. you spend so much time doing it. And right. It, in, in some days, it's, it is the majority of your day. Take it, time spent on your job is time not spent doing X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Even though the job fulfills, you know, paying your bills and being able mm -hmm. to buy things and all of that it's still it's it's hard to kind of separate that out from yourself if that's mm -hmm. what you're spending the bulk of your time doing or you spent a lot of 
time and energy and resources getting a degree to then get this job Mm -hmm. to then have you know the wherewithal or the honesty with yourself to say you know I don't want to do this Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and and I think that um that's you know I talk a lot about toxic professionalism in my coaching because that is you know it it's um the pressures that we feel, you know, professionalism is this like, concept of like behaving and making decisions and existing and performing in a way that um, that aligns with like conditioned beliefs and, and other people's expectations, right? Other like expectations that we, um, we've been taught. And so, um, and it's gone beyond just here's what's expected of me, but it's also like, this is what's expected of me. And I need to do it at any, at any cost. Um, and part of that is part of one of those pressures is I need to just stick it out. I just need to stay because even though I'm miserable, yeah, I just need to suck it up. Right. And, or yeah, I mean, and people, and people people feel that way for a number of reasons. If they've been at the company for 15 years, they feel like they owe it. They owe it to the company to, to, to keep being there. Um, or, you know, if, if they haven't been at the company that long, they say, well, I can't leave because I'll look like a job jumper. And all of those things are people pleasing. All of those things are um, fueling toxic professionalism because it's not healthy for our own like mental health, uh, physical health and, and, it doesn't always align with our own values and our own energy. Yeah, I, I definitely want to, I'm glad you went there because I was really um, moved by the term kind careerism um, mm-hmm. as a broad term, but also as a way that we can treat ourselves um, mm-hmm. for the reasons you just mentioned, because you know, I would say that most of us are our own worst critics and also, um, there's a lot of pressure, societal pressure to perform in a certain way. And these expectations that, that you know, contribute to toxic professionalism that, you know, if you step back and say, well, whose standards are these? You know, and it's so ingrained over however many generations that right, right. it's hard to see yourself out of it. Um, yeah. But I would love to hear more about the term kind careerism. Why, yeah. you know, why does it matter so much and how can it kind of shift this approach and conversation around careers in general? Yeah, absolutely. So, so kind careerism is the, the vision. It is the, the practice. It is the, um, a totally different way of seeing yourself as you fit into your own career. Um, it's the antidote to toxic professionalism, right? Toxic professionalism has been fueled by, um, you know, patriarchy, uh, capitalism, and uh, white supremacy, and ableism, and um, and it's been it's it's become the status quo over many many you know generations of working, and so with kind careerism, you you realize that you can make decisions not based on these conditioned beliefs, but rather in a way that's kind to ourselves, kind to others and challenges the unkind. It's making decisions that um, align with our own values, our own priorities, our own non-negotiable needs that feel good to us. And not because we have to conform or not because we have to, um, you know, give into these, these pressures uh, that don't, that don't make us feel good, that, that don't, uh, that don't really serve us in the end. Um, So kind careerism is, is the, it's the process, it's the, the practice, it's the, it's the vision and it's really the antidote to um, shifting the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see labor, the way that we see ourselves and our 
our career, just like on an individual basis and, um, and at a greater level too. Uh, it's, it's like, it's just, it's, you know, beyond just a warm, fuzzy sort of philosophy that I use for coaching. I think it, it, it really is a, um, a vision to, to strive for. I wonder, um, have you received feedback about this from any others in your field? Is there, you know, a network of strategists and coaches that meet with <laughs> periodically to talk shop? Or is it something that, you know, are others approaching this work in that way? I'm just wondering how this fits into the greater ecosystem of um, your work. In an effort to not um, fuel my own like comparison monster, <laughs> my own inner bully. Um, I, I mean, I love learning about how other coaches uh, do work and how other entrepreneurs do work, but um, this, this felt so, I felt so strongly about this as a vision um, that, you know, like any company that has a, a vision, they have a vision, they have a mission statement, um, they have values. This is my, you know, this is my mission statement, my vision statement, my fuels, my, my values, right. Um, for my, for my company. And so, um, so no, I haven't, I haven't gotten any feedback from, other coaches, um, but I can say from just my many, many conversations with um, with folks and clients that this resonates with them. Yeah, it, it is very different <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> Thank you. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the services you offer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I love working one-on-one -on -one with clients. I think that is... Um, it is an amazing way to just to to get deeper into um, how people see themselves and how they how that impacts how they exist in the world and that impacts their their careers and the impact that they um, they make in other people's lives, et cetera. So um, there's nothing there's nothing more important to me than than that and. So that's really what my services are um, are based on. So, you know, career coaching in a in a traditional sense, you may um, expect uh, you know a deep dive into um, a resume, a cover letter, LinkedIn bio, um, and salary negotiation. And the the work that I'm doing with clients is really like the you know the foundational pieces that happen before the job search, before they leave their their job that they know they need to leave. Um, it's, it's getting in touch with who they are at their core. It's figuring out what their priorities are, non-negotiable needs, and making sure that they can articulate those so that, you know, when it does come time to make some tough decisions, whether it's to leave or to take a new job or, um, or I mean, to move across the country, like it's just, having those understanding of what, what their values are, what their needs are um, to make decisions against, right? Do, do, do these decisions align with, with those? Um, I also work with folks on just general confidence. And again, like we were talking before about how it's not, it's, it's all connected. You can't just compartmentalize like I'm, you know, um, I'm confident in this and then, you know, I'm, I'm confident in my career, but I'm not confident in anything else or I'm confident in everything else, but not my career. Um, I think it's, it's, it overlaps a lot. And so um, doing some of the work there for just digging deeper into um, how people see themselves, how they treat themselves, how they talk to themselves and actually replacing this bad habit of listening to our inner bullies with listening to our 
inner super fan, our inner, um, our inner best friends. Uh, so, you know, doing, doing the deep work there. And then, um, and then lastly, connecting with other people, advocating for yourself, telling your story to others with ease. I mean, that takes work. It takes, it, it, it actually takes, um, it takes folks a lot of time to, um, to, to figure out like those words that feel good telling other people. Right. And, and then, um, and then standing up for yourself. So part of that is um, challenging the unkind, right? That part of kind careerism. So, so working on that piece as well and being able to, um, you know, stand up for what you believe in, advocate for what you want. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's broadly, broadly what I do. Um, so I have that broken down into uh, a, a few different programs, one being the career strategy jumpstart for those people who are just getting started. Um, the um, doing that like stress busting, self-compassion um, program, and then finally the um, building meaningful connections with people. And then if a client is interested in working on all of those things, I have the kind careerism program where we, we cover all of those topics. And, um, and again, the whole, the whole goal being, you know, beyond just having a career strategy and knowing what your action plan is and having next steps, it's also changing the way that you see yourself the way that you do work and the way that you um, do careers, the way that you, you know, see yourself in your career, uh, because that's really what's going to change. It's going to change everything else, right? It's going to change like how you present yourself in, um, in your job search, in your cover letters, in your networking, in your interviews, and just beyond that. Um, seeing your value beyond how you how you make money. Is that a big shift for clients? That's usually the uh, the biggest shift, right? So I, I'm used to working with folks over the course of nine weeks, and in <laughs> over that nine weeks, I mean, sometimes it's like I'm talking to a totally different person from the time that we started talking and it's a, it's really, really gratifying and really just, it's like magic to just see these folks and their energy just completely transform over the course of, you know, a few weeks. And it's um, yeah, that's why I love doing this so much. So, I mean, initially I, I would think, oh, success is a new career that is better than the one you had before, but in that also is success, this transformation. Right, exactly, exactly. It's not just let's get the next job and feel good about it. Beyond that, it's also like, let's feel good. Let's figure out how you are going to feel good about yourself and just, you know, recognizing these conditioned beliefs and, and how to break through those so that you're not just spending all of this energy performing and people pleasing and being a perfectionist. It's like, how can we, um, you know, how can we live our life in a way that again, aligns with our own values, our own energy, our own priorities and non-negotiable needs and not other people's. Yeah, and, and just breaking through our own conditioned beliefs. It's really, it is really transformative and just for me, super fun. The Bard MBA program is now accepting proposals for client projects for our NYC lab consulting course. In this year long class, teams of Bard MBA students solve sustainability challenges for real world clients under the guidance of Professor Laura Gitman, Chief Operating Officer of BSR. Past clients include NASDAQ, Etsy, Medgar Evers College, Unilever, Just Salad, Thinks, Cliff Bar, and more. Proposals are due July 8th and are welcome from companies and organizations of all sizes. 
find more information at gps.bard.edu slash academics slash NYC lab. I'm interested. So you alluded to this. Why, you know, what led you to create your own company? Um, are you able or are you interested in telling us a little bit more about your professional background prior to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a really windy path. I studied environmental studies and business in, in, um, in school, undergrad. And um, when I graduated in 2013, I had a really hard time finding an entry level position. So um, I did the, you know, a lot of different internships, which you know, looking back was actually really awesome because I got to um, experience a lot of different uh, workplaces and different bosses and different um, industries. And it, within the environmental space, I ended up working um, in the public sector uh, in, in environmental sustainability and, and communications. Um, and then made, you know, a few years later, made the switch to a, uh, a tech startup that helped, uh, it helped mission-driven companies engage their employees in social impact programs. So I was doing that um, and getting much more intrigued by employee experience and building cultures where people feel a sense of belonging um, since like, you know, like we talked about, like you spend a lot of time at work. So, um, you know, companies are trying to like crack the, crack the code, crack the mystery of, um, building environments where people, uh, people feel a sense of belonging and, and are thriving. And so, um, so I worked with companies on a consultant, like consulting uh, level. And then, and then I actually did end up working for one of my clients on their HR team uh, in people and culture initiatives. So, you know, with, during that time and through all of those, those pivots and those transitions, like there was definitely some career identity crises going on that I had to navigate. And, and looking back, it was because I put so much of my identity, so much of my, the weight of my identity in what I did for work. So when I got laid off from the tech startup, when I, um, you know, the funding or like the deadlines were blurry for my contract position, when I, you know, the HR team reorged and my role was eliminated, it was like, every time it was a career identity crisis. And so um, when this last, you know, this last episode of career identity crisis occurred in 2019, I started job searching um, and then the pandemic hit. It just, you know, I had finally figured out that if, if I wanted to do what I, what I, what I wanted, I was going to need to do it myself. And so that's, that's how I got into entrepreneurship. Um, so I was consulting and I started, started with coaching. Um, but having learned, having done both employee engagement and motivation and, and, and working in that and studying in that um, for seven years, both as in-house on an HR team and in um, consulting for, for other mission different social impact companies. Um, I just felt like I learned so, I just, I got to see the side of business where companies are trying to, like I said, that kind of crack this code of like building something that makes money and can scale, but also treats humans like humans, right? Treats their employees like humans. <laughs> and then from the, from the coaching side and having been a job seeker and, um, you know, kind of been on the other side where you're just trying to get your foot in the door at some place that 
is going to care about you <laughs> just like on a like on the most basic level um or recognizing something at work that you don't like and advocating for a change like being able to kind of like work at work on those things on at both like at both ends or both sides um has been really fascinating and i i think that just um like organization organizational psychology has always been really fascinating to me like beyond just building teams it's also like teams that thrive where people feel good where people feel a sense of belonging um yeah just just always been fascinated by that and um i've always just been like reading books on that and listening to um podcasts and audio books and and you know reading articles and and just engaged in that even when i wasn't working in it um so that's a bit more about my my background and my interests. Great, I'm sure that resonates with many. Um, even just getting into um, purpose-driven work, it's not a straight line. Mm -hmm. And careers often are not, and that's another way to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. that everything doesn't happen in a straight line. Right, absolutely, yeah, it's, it's not, um, nothing is linear. And, you know, I've had to, you know, part of my own inner bully or my own, like, kind of giving into the, this pressure of toxic professionalism that you are more value, more valuable if you're specialized. Well, being a generalist, I was like, well, <laughs> where am I, who, you know, what am I going to do with this? So what am I, like, I know a little bit about a lot of different things and um and was was scared about that like actually you know shame, for a while it was shame like i'm just a generalist well yeah just a generalist means that i am a really good entrepreneur and so um i think i've always you know i've always been the person to like see a gap and want to fill it I want to create something new. You know, I started, I started the clubs in college. I, um, you know, always like dreamed of kind of having my own business one day. And my friends are like, well, that doesn't need to be someday that can be right now. <laughs> so I think once those seeds were, were planted, I was like, yes, this, this needs to happen. This is what, this is what I'm going to do. And realizing that, you know, I think all of my, my windy road, help me develop these generalist skills that have made me a good entrepreneur and, and, and seeing that, you know, it all kind of like, it's, it's all worked out in my favor that way. Um, advice for other entrepreneurs. Is there anything, um, challenges or surprises that came out of starting your own business and any advice you'd recommend to others looking to do the same? Um, so I, Definitely think that everybody should have uh, business business coaches, multiple business coaches and mentors. Um, you know, especially as a solo entrepreneur, I realized very early on that I could not do this alone. Um, and actually, that was one of the reasons that I I decided to start was because my mentor was like, "You're not going to do this alone. This is not a thing that that happens, you know, in a vacuum." Um, so having this like informal group of advisors and coaches um, to support me along the way has been absolutely critical. And part of the challenge of figuring out how to build your own business is, is, is one getting, is, is really becoming an expert in your, um, in your audience. Right. I think a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you this, like it's getting to know your audience on a really deep level so that you understand what their challenges are and that you are solving, you are building programs or products or services to help them solve their problems. And that's the really satisfying thing about, um, you know, 
is is like kind of happening in parallel here is you're you're solving problems, but you're also figuring out how to run a business around solving those problems. So it's been a really fun challenge for sure. I'm really, um, I feel like every day I'm learning so much and it's gratifying to know that what I've built is really making a difference in people's lives and how they see themselves and, um, and, and how they exist in the world. Yeah, long-winded way of saying, uh, find advisors, uh, find mentors, find coaches. It's well worth the, um, those relationships are, are well worth the, you know, the investment. And then um, make sure that you are an expert in your, your audience, like who you want to serve, who you want, who you actually want to help and their, their problems and, and understanding that so that um, it's not all about, here's my solution. Look how great my solution is. It's here is the problem that you have that I solve. And, and being an, an expert and being, um, being impactful in that way. I'm taken with the fact that you're so open about your personal history, neurodivergence and your partial deafness. Most people would shy away from this level of transparency and honesty. Why did you decide to make this part of your public profile? I think because I shied away from it for so long. Like these are, um, I do wear hearing aids, but my, my uh, ADD and my dyslexia and my deafness have all been mostly non-apparent disabilities. Um, and I use non-apparent because um, when you say invisible disabilities, it's like, you know, hiding on purpose. And, and that is what I was doing for a long time. And now I call them um, non-apparent because I'm not hiding them anymore. They're just, um, they're just not, they're not visible. Um, and so it took me some time really like just like within the last few years, I've done the work to recognize my own internalized ableism and how shameful I felt, how I, it was something that I had been taught though, right? It was something that like the world was, um, conditioning me to believe that my body was broken or my brain was broken or my ears were broken. And the truth is that's, that's, that's just false. That's just not true. Um, and I have a ton of skills and a ton of um, superpowers and a ton of ways of seeing the world that are actually fueled by my disabilities. So, um, you know, I'm not, we with disabilities are not impaired by our dis. We are not impaired by our disabilities. We are impaired by ableist environments that can't accommodate us. And so, you know, in realizing this and 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 choosing to love myself, choosing to be proud of who I am and and recognizing that there are more ways to thrive in the world than being um, like neurotypical and, 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 and able-bodied and like just recognizing that in myself and recognizing that in, in others and, in, and learning more about um, deaf culture and and following more entrepreneurs with disabilities and neurodivergence, like it was just so inspiring to me and, and really just changed my whole um, perspective. And felt, I just felt like it isn't something that to me is worth hiding when like I have already made the decision to love myself in defiance of a world that taught me that I 
am not lovable because of those reasons. So, um, so really in like a radical rebellion, I am choosing to be loud and proud about those things. And right, there's like two ways to be about it. <laughs> to be open and to, to be closed. And so I'm choosing to be open. Um, and that's been really freeing and it was like, scary to start talking about those things. And, you know, um, but I find that the more people know, the more I, the more easily I found the environments where I was going to thrive because people, you know, I found the people that were willing to accommodate me um, or just had more patience because they understood that uh, they might need to talk to me like a little bit more clearly or repeat themselves or, um, you know, I might need to take virtual calls so I can wear headphones as opposed to being in a conference room. They're just like over the years realizing for me to be open about it and to, um, find the people and places and environments where I was going to thrive was more important than hiding it and pretending and trying to like pretend that that would just like that it didn't exist so that I could fit into some mold that you know really didn't that was just exhausting and 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 didn't work for me and I I know that's not the case um, for everybody and not everybody feels safe revealing their, um, their disabilities or their neurodivergence, but it was the right choice for me to be open about it. And I hope that it encourages, um, encourages other people to feel like they can be themselves too. I agree. And it also goes along with your, you know, your company ethos of kind to yourself and also exactly exactly it. you know people don't talk about these things and then they're kind of going along with the status quo that you know we discussed was created by somebody else and we're yes. not pushing back against it yes exactly exactly like let's not continue to try to fit into what we were taught is professionalism and 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 define our own professionalism would so this must really resonate with clients then your transparency and your openness yeah I do have some clients that um you know come to me and they say I you know I haven't felt comfortable being myself whether they have disabilities or not, just like in general, like in general, people are like, I have been taught to not feel comfortable being myself and that I need to perform to conform. I need to be a certain way because that's what's expected of me. And that's what's been, you know, I've been taught. I need to act and speak a certain way and look a certain way and, and dress a certain way and wear my hair a certain way. <laughs> and um, so, you know, beyond just having, um, having disabilities and being open about that, it's also, I think it helps to uh, do the work to unlearn what, or to at least recognize these standards that have been forced upon us, because that's the way it is. And recognizing like, actually that's not, but that's not the way we want it to be, <laughs> right? And, and, and doing things differently. And that's kindness, right? Like doing things in a way that's like, I'm not just gonna go along and be a people pleaser. I'm going to do things in a way that's kind to myself, that's kind to others and challenges the unkind. Very well said. Um, are there any other thoughts you would like to share? Are you accepting new clients? 
yeah, absolutely. Love, uh, love meeting new clients, love chatting with people. I do um, 30 minute get to know you sessions. Uh, you can check that out on my website, laurengoldbergcoaching.com. I also post a lot on LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn super user. And uh, you can also sign up for my emails and get more tips and um, thoughts and perspective on, on kind careerism. Thank you so much, Lauren. This is so helpful. And I know it will resonate with most, if not all of our listeners. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for helping me spread kind careerism. We appreciate our loyal impact report listeners and hope you can help us spread the word about the series and the important sustainability work of our guests. Please rate and review the impact report wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you were inspired by this conversation, share a screenshot on Instagram and tag impact report podcast. Follow Lauren on LinkedIn and learn more about her work and services by visiting laurengoldbergcoaching.com. And be sure to head to greenbiz.com or impactentrepreneur.com to read a recap of our conversation. Join us for the next episode of the Impact Report on Friday, June 10th. We'll be speaking with Steve Lore of J. Lore Vineyards. Interested in learning how you can launch a high-impact, purpose-driven career in sustainability? Check out the resources page from the Bard Graduate Programs in Sustainability for access to free resources to jumpstart your career. Hear from leaders in the fields of climate change, consulting, impact finance, circular economy, and more about how they launched their careers and the tips they have for you to join their industries. Visit gps.bard.edu resources today.